How do you know that the Bible that you study today is anything like what the apostles wrote, or much less what the prophets wrote thousands and thousands of years ago? We've all played the gossip game where you tell a story to one who tells it to another person who tells it to another person and have seen the story change dramatically in just a few generations. And for thousands of years, these writings have been copied and recopied and recopied. And so how do you know that what we have today is anything like what they wrote? If you've talked to very many people about the Bible, you've heard that kind of an objection. And hopefully you have a good answer. I think there are a number of ways to approach it. But I think that's one of the powerful messages of the Dead Sea Scrolls. It is dependable. That is, the Bible that we have today is like what the apostles wrote and what the prophets wrote. We understand the objection and the difficulty that people have in grasping that because everything that we know about in this world goes downhill. It deteriorates, and we'll talk more about that in the week to come. And so things tend to degenerate. Why not the message that the apostles and the prophets wrote? We understand from Genesis chapter 3, the beginning of this deteriorative process, where a curse was placed on the earth. The ground is uh, cursed in you because of you. You will eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall grow. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread, you shall return to the ground, because from it you were taken, for you were dust, and to dust you shall return. This pervades, I think, the whole universe. Isaiah speaks of this effect that we see in the world when he says the grass withers, the flower fades. When the breath of the Lord blows on it, surely the people are grass, the grass withers, the flower fades. But then he tells us there is an exception to this downward degenerative process. But, he says, the word of God stands forever. That's different. Now, this is the promise of the word of God, and some say, well, but how do you know that this is true? Uh, and one of the evidences would be from the Dead Sea Scrolls. But we need to understand what God's Word does promise, and that is that there is an exception. Jesus himself says in Matthew 24, Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Now, we have radical teachers like Joseph Smith and like Mohammed that says the Word did pass away, and that's why you have to have new writings, and uh, you have to pay attention to what they've written that I believe is very different. But it doesn't need to be replaced if it's never passed away. Peter is quoting from Isaiah in 1 Peter chapter 1 when he says, All flesh is like grass, and its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers, the flower falls off. Again, but the exception is the word of the Lord, which endures forever. And then Peter goes on to apply that to what the apostles have written, not just the Old Testament scriptures, this is the word that was preached to you by the apostles. Now, that's the promise. In spite of that promise, we're told over and over again that it has degenerated, and even from religious leaders, that it needs to be replaced. 
But in spite of the fact that information about the Dead Sea Scrolls is filtered most of the time through liberal scholars, we have very good, I believe, confirmation of exactly what Isaiah and Jesus and Peter are promising here. And I think that's the primary significance of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Let's begin by talking about the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, which is a, a very interesting story and will by no means cover all of the story. But when it was first announced back in the 40s, it was declared even in Time magazine to be the greatest manuscript discovery of all time by William Albright, who was considered dean of the American archaeologist. We're told that these two individuals, along with several others who were with them, teenagers at the time, were near the Dead Sea. They were uh, shepherding sheep, goats, and they had lost one of the goats. They were hunting for it. And in the process of trying to find their lost livestock, they found the Dead Sea Scrolls. This is one of the individuals, not one of the two that's often pictured, but one of the ones who claims to have been there, and there's good evidence for that claim, who went with us here to Cave One and is posing to show us where they were originally found. The actual opening he's standing before was added uh, by the archaeologists later in order to gain access to it. There was a hole up at the top, which was the only access at the time they were discovered, and he was thinking maybe one of the little lambs had scampered up and gone into that hole, and so he tossed a rock into the hole to see if he would scare the goat out, and he heard the breaking of pottery, and as a result realized that there, was, uh, there were pottery vases inside. He lowered himself inside and found some 37 of these vases. We have a replica of the type here that's made especially to hold the Dead Sea Scrolls. He removed at least seven of these scrolls and carried them back to his tent. They stayed there for uh, maybe a couple of years before he realized the significance of it, or they did. In talking to some of the ones who were there and who had them in their tents, they were... Uh, of course, uh, aware of the fact they were very important. Uh, the parchment on which they were written uh, was unusual, uh, reserved for very important documents, and so they used them for important documents, like uh, divorce documents. If they wanted to divorce their wife, they'd take some of the Dead Sea Scrolls and write on the back of it. And so we proposed maybe hunting for some of those ancient divorce documents and seeing if we can find more of the scrolls. But eventually they realized that this was important enough that they could sell and get some money for. Uh, through a series of uh, intriguing events, they finally wound up with Kendo, who lived in Bethlehem at the time. He had a, a gift antiquity shop uh, in the St. George Hotel there in Jerusalem. Uh, he was a cobbler. He thought originally he could use some of this leather parchment material, uh, maybe to repair some shoes. Uh, it was in excellent condition, sealed in the jars. Eventually, it came to the attention of Alexander, uh, Eliezer Solnik, who was a professor at Hebrew University there in Jerusalem. And he understood, uh, and, and I'm, I'm just greatly condensing the story, that these were very important documents and was able to acquire three of them. Four of them were purchased by Mr. Samuel, who was with the, the Syrian Orthodox Church, uh, one of the Metropolitans. Uh, he, along with John Trevor, uh, verified that these were very ancient documents, and uh, Mr. Samuel then advertised them in the Wall Street Journal, of all places. The son uh, of the one who had purchased the first three, Mr. Selnick, uh, Yagil Yadin, who was also leader of the Israeli underground army at the time. This was before Israel had become a state, just almost exactly that time, but just before. And Jerusalem was under siege by the Arabs. Bethlehem was under total control of the Arabs. And uh, Mr. Selnik had to travel there uh, against the advice of his son to purchase the first three. And now then, 
Mr. Samuel, who's got the other four advertised in the Wall Street Journal, Yagil Yadin, the son, was in New York at the time, saw the paper and arranged through an intermediary, necessary because he would not have sold them to an Israeli, uh, to purchase these for the sum of a quarter of a million dollars. They would be worth much more than that, of course, if they had realized the full significance. So all seven of them came to be possessed then by Hebrew University in Jerusalem and are now housed in the Shrine of the Book that we see here. Inside, you can see on the walls, perhaps in the inset, where they're displayed in a temperature-controlled, light-controlled environment, some of the most important documents in the world. Let's think about the site of the Dead Sea Scrolls. It's the northwest corner of the Dead Sea, about 15 miles as the crow flies from Jerusalem, right on the edge of the seashore. And this is where uh, a renegade community, renegade in terms of the way the Orthodox Jews thought about it from Jerusalem, they thought the ones in Jerusalem were Orthodox, uh, that is, were renegades. Uh, I think there's a sense in which they were both right. Uh, we see the, the temple in Jesus' time built by Herod, a megalomaniac, uh, certainly not a righteous person, trying to outdo Solomon with all of his building program. Uh, and as Jesus uh, reveals in the writings of the New Testament, uh, he was very much opposed to a lot of what was going on. They were too, though they had some pretty strange ideas in this community. It was excavated in the 50s, and it was a very elaborate complex probably the dwelling place of about 200 people. They weren't married. They didn't believe uh, that sex was appropriate. And somehow they survived for almost 300 years there through a heavy recruiting program. Uh, they had some other unusual ideas, but they also, usually unknown, unrevealed by the liberal scholars who will tell you about them. They, these were kooks, according to them. Uh, they also had some very righteous conduct and uh, some excellent insights into the Scriptures. And there's some facts about them that I think provide some excellent evidence for us uh, in, in view of the, the concept of Scripture that we have today. But we have restored this, and we can see that they had a very elaborate water system. They certainly weren't dummies. They had engineered an aqueduct to bring water from the nearby mountains. And they had all kinds of uh, washing pools, ceremonial baths. It's been restored to look something like this, up to three-story buildings here with what's called the watchtower. And then the scriptorium was at least two stories. That's a very interesting building. Some have tried to depreciate this, saying it was just a pottery factory because of the insights that we gain when we look at their attitude toward Scripture and toward the Messiah. They want to discredit that. So it was just a pottery factory. But when we look at this building, we see that the benches were built to stretch out the scrolls, uh, a replica of which we have behind us. The ink wells are found in the ruins. And so they were stretching out scrolls, sewing them together, writing on these benches, uh, and I think it's pretty obvious what they were doing. And this is where the scrolls came from. Those clay benches that were designed to roll the scrolls out and to uh, facilitate the copying of them uh, have, of course, been recovered. Many of them are, or several of them, are on display in the Rockefeller Museum today. And some of them are in Armand, Jordan, that you can see here. But this whole community was uh, a worshiping community, uh, considering themselves much more orthodox and uh, righteous, uh, appropriate, uh, loved of God than any of what was going on in Jerusalem. In 66 AD, the Jews revolted against Rome. At that point, they understood that there was going to be big problems. And so they began to take all of their scrolls and hide them in the caves, sealing them in these jars sealed with beeswax. 
and uh, that accounts for the just almost miraculous preservation of some of them. This intact Isaiah scroll is just beautifully preserved. It's somewhat burnt along the edges, uh, but just uh, excellent preservation. Two years after uh, they revolted against Rome, uh, the 10th Roman legion marched into this area 19, uh, or in 68 AD and destroyed it, completely burned it, and did set up camp there and lived there for maybe 25 years. Uh, they evidently did not find the scrolls. They're hidden in the caves in the surrounding areas. There are 11 of them that have been found. This scene is uh, about a quarter of a mile north of the Qumran area. We were able to go up to those caves when I was there in December. I was working as a geological consultant for the dig that was going on at that time, just finishing up uh, that dig. And here is the wolf, one of the fellows, one of the two fellows that we pictured initially that was there when the scrolls were found, who went up with us to cave one and to several of the other caves and told us, <laughs> in quotes, uh, speaking, of course, in Arabic through a translator, uh, of the events and described it for us. His grandson, Yosef, uh, is an accomplished archaeologist and has been able to work with us in the excavations. Actually, he's co-director of the dig. But it was exciting to be able to talk to them, to get into the caves, to see where they were found, and uh, uh, to, to be there where this exciting historical event took place. Uh, the wolf, well, I won't try to pronounce his Arabic name, uh, one of the co-discoverers initially uh, was with us throughout the area, uh, throughout the time we were digging, and of course with his grandson. Standing here on the plateau where we were excavating, you see in the background Cave 4 and Cave 5. Cave 4 is perhaps the most important of the caves. Uh, the Bedouins found eventually over 15,000 fragments. The archaeologists found another 40,000 fragments. Sometimes people say, well, they held these things for so long, there was some sort of shenanigans going on. Well, you, you got uh, over 50,000 fragments. You don't just put those together easily. They're from over 400 manuscripts. Uh, that is from this cave, a total of 800 manuscripts from all of the caves. And about 100 from this cave were from biblical manuscripts. But the papyrus on which they were written, uh, and the parchment, uh, mainly parchment. Uh, if it's not sealed in the jars, of course, uh, does not uh, hold together. It does deteriorate and had to be pieced back together. We look inside Cave 4, and you see that this is a man-made cave, perhaps uh, an original cave that they have enlarged and embellished. And in the fissure there in the foreground, you see where most of the fragments had collected and were found. Uh, it's a very picturesque spot today, uh, and you can go look at the remains. Uh, can't go out where we were uh, performing the excavation. We'll talk more about it in a moment. As you look across the Dead Sea from this site, you can see Mount Nebo directly across the Dead Sea the spot where Moses surveyed the promised land. But this, uh, the remains can be viewed, uh, and tourists go through there. Our dig site was out on the plateau. We were responding to this charge that uh, they were disconnected from the scrolls, that they were just uh, a pottery factory, and uh, through means that we'll describe in just a moment. But this was not a tour. This, this was hard work. We moved quite a bit of dirt but uh, it was a, a very nice place to do it, though uh, it's hot. <laughs> it's the lowest spot on earth, about 1,300 feet below sea level. Even in December, it's uh, near 100. In, in the summer, it's about 130. Um, and you can see the site here, uh, beginning with the Dead Sea over on the left, and then as you pan across, you can see the trenches that we were excavating to find some of the pottery and the meals that were buried by the community. And you can get an idea of the kind of work that's going on here as the, the Bedouins are helping us and tossing it to the fellow up on top who is a grad student at Criswell 
college here in Dallas. Joseph was the co-director of the dig, and it was a real honor to be able to work with him. Uh, he's highly qualified, and we were able to learn a great deal about the area. And it was interesting to see him visit with his grandfather and reminisce about the original findings and, of course, their continued search. Uh, our area was on the eastern portion, uh, which dealt with this pre-Hasmonean circular pit. The Hasmonean area is the, sometimes what we would call the period between the Testaments. And we were excavating these bowls, these cooking pots. And one of the things that's obvious when you excavate the remains is that these people in the first place ate very well. <laughs> and they had elaborate clothing. This is a jar that had wine in it. You can see from the residue. Many people say, well, John the Baptist came from the wilderness and was an Essene that was here in this Qumran community, but uh, he didn't dress that well. He didn't drink. He didn't eat that well. Locusts and wild honey is different from the feast that we see remains of. I see no connection at all. I see a contrast. Uh, these were rather wealthy people. They gave all of their money to the community when they joined up, and uh, they lived well from this uh, communal arrangement. But we were looking carefully at the remains of the meals, which they ceremonially buried in the pottery, and found from the DNA analysis of these bones that the DNA matched the sheepskin, so that the sheep that were used to make the skins on which the scrolls were written matches the sheep that they were eating. <laughs> they were of the same family, which refutes the idea that this was just a pottery factory. Now that's, uh, some have suggested, maybe not real wise because the people from whom we have to get the permits for these archaeological digs are the ones that have proposed the idea that it was just a pottery factory. Uh, the head of the West Bank Archaeological Division uh, is the one that wrote that article, and we just blew it sky high. <laughs> and we're now trying to get another permit. Uh, we appreciate your prayers there. Uh, let's talk about the contents of the Dead Sea Scrolls. There's a lot of misinformation, I think. Obviously, it's not all Scripture. Some 400 of the manuscripts, about half, are these uh, crazy things, the, this pseudo-hypocryphal, uh, fake uh, scripture, uh, books that are not inspired, that somehow uh, give the impression of inspiration. And so what were, this, uh, what were they doing with this if they had so much respect for scripture? Well, if you go back in Ricky's library, back here, you look and you'll see a number of books that would be Scripture, but the majority of it would not be Scripture. It would be commentaries, and there's probably some pretty squirrely ideas in some of the books that are in that library. Certainly in my library, I have books written by pretty crazy folk, you know, that, that have wrong ideas that I need to know about so I can answer and that's the majority of the library, and I think that's the case with their library. And the fact that you find some of these squirrely books, uh, crazy ideas, uh, is not surprising at all. They hid their library. Two hundred of uh, the texts are what are called sectarian texts or manuscripts. This was uh, peculiar to the Qumran community, the Essenes. Uh, the Book of Discipline particularly gives us insight into how they lived, and they, they baptized two or three times a day. Now, they, they really believed in baptism, <laughs> and they had the pools uh, all over the place. And as we suggested, didn't believe in marriage and some, some other ideas. But what's really interesting is their view toward Scripture that we'll talk more about. And so about uh, a quarter of the library, probably a greater percentage than in my library, were of actual manuscripts or uh, copies of the scriptures. Uh, they would copy and recopy, perhaps almost wear out and retire, and then make new copies. But they were a very devoted religious sect, uh, devoted to studying the scriptures. Twenty-four uh, copies of Genesis 
were found, 33 of Deuteronomy. These are the, the books that they seem to give more emphasis to. Uh, we find that Isaiah uh, was a very popular book, 22, and that's very significant for reasons that we'll mention again in a moment. Psalms, uh, many copies of the Psalms, 39. And actually we find every book of the Old Testament represented with the exception of Esther, and there is reference to Esther in some of the commentaries that indicate they thought Esther was a part of the canon, what was inspired. I think we'll find fragments as we continue to search here of Esther. But that's the only one that was missing. But we find whole or fragmentary copies of every book in the Old Testament with the exception of Esther and Esther's referred to. Perhaps most significant is the fact that 12 of the scrolls are written in Paleo-Hebrew. One of the great challenges to faith uh, is a theory that has overthrown the faith of thousands, some of my close friends, that says that the early books of the Bible weren't written back by Moses. This documentary hypothesis, as it's referred to, tells us that they were actually written after the exile, made up to look like Israel was ancient to give greater political significance to the people at that time. Uh, and they've got computer analysis and very technical uh, approaches to try to prove that. Twelve of these are written in the Paleo-Hebrew, which is the style that was only used prior to the exile. After the exile, they added vowels, they changed the shape of the letters, and it's very easy to see the difference. Now, I don't think these were actually written prior to the exile, but they're copies of manuscripts that were written, which prove they were in existence prior to the exile. The oldest scroll is the Genesis scroll, uh, written in Paleo-Hebrew, Dated to, uh, I was noticing in Wikipedia this morning, they say uh, possibly as early as 325 B.C., but conservatively 300 years before Christ. But in Paleo-Hebrew, which indicates this is a copy of that which was before the exile. Here is Genesis, a part of the books that they say had to be written after the exile that we know from the Dead Sea Scrolls was not that it was in existence prior to the exile, and so that documentary hypothesis is exploded for that and several other reasons. There were a number of interpretive commentaries, which I think are very insightful. The liberals don't like them, <laughs> because they believed them. They believed the Bible, and their commentaries indicate that. They believed that they were prophetic, and that they foresaw the coming of the Messiah, and they understood the Messiah better than the apostles did. They understood that, as New Testament writers did, that this was God's Word, but they referred to the Messiah as a pierced Messiah, one that would die and that would be resurrected. Now, the liberals think this idea of a Messiah that died and then was resurrected developed hundreds of years after Christ, and that the New Testament was written long after New Testament times, and that this was just a spin put on early ideas that developed over hundreds of years. They got it from the Old Testament prophecies hundreds of years before the time of Christ. This is not an oddball developed spin on the, on the, on, on the Old Testament prophecies. This is derived directly from the prophecies even before Christ arrived. The Isaiah scroll, the great Isaiah scroll, as it's referred to, that's on display in the shrine of the book in that museum that we have replicated here behind us, uh, is one of the most exciting. If you study Isaiah in seminary today, you won't study Isaiah. You'll study Isaiah 1 and Isaiah 2. Now, the liberals have to split this because the latter part of Isaiah has prophecies in it if it were written at the time of Isaiah, it would have to be a supernatural prophecy. And so they fixed that. They split it. This is Isaiah. Now, we know Isaiah 1. Yes, that was written at the time of Isaiah. They, they, but that doesn't contain the prophecy. Isaiah 2 had to be written again after the exile. That was made up to make it look like prophecy. 
And so when they found the Isaiah scroll, which dates to 300 years before Christ and a copy of that which was before the exile, they certainly expected to find two different scrolls as it's taught in seminary, Isaiah 1, Isaiah 2. <laughs> Not so. All one complete intact scroll written in Paleo-Hebrew. All together, as you see here, 24 feet long. Interestingly, in the margins, and uh, as you can see here with the red spot, uh, you have markings of the Messianic passages that they understood. 300 years before the Messiah arrived, they understood what this was about. Uh, you see why the liberals don't like them. And they don't tell you about this part. of. Uh, they tell you about the kooky stuff. Uh, but there's much more. One of the most exciting finds involves Cave 7, and, and if, if I were speaking to a Jewish audience in Jerusalem, you'd hear big groans right now. Uh, there's no New Testament at Qumran, but yes, I believe there is. In Cave 7, of course this is not 300 years before Christ, this is from the first century. In Cave 7, we have different types of manuscripts. They're written on papyrus rather than the parchment, the sheepskin. And it is written in Greek, not the Hebrew or Paleo-Hebrew. Cave 7 has collapsed. Its uh, sides and roof have fallen away, and 19 small fragments of papyrus were found, and they couldn't read them initially, and then as they continued to study, oh yes, here is part of Exodus, and here is part of Jeremiah, and we can find that, and of course with computer analysis they can see how these letters would fit into a text, but they couldn't read the rest of them. Seventeen of the nineteen fragments were unread, the reason was they had to find them in the Old Testament, uh, and they weren't Old Testament. They were New Testament fragments. One of the most obvious is from Mark, and this particular fragment mentions uh, Gennesaret, which is a peculiar word for the Sea of Galilee used only in the first century, and so this helps date it together with the style of the letters. And this is a quotation from Mark 6, 52 and 53 that mentions Gennesaret. Now, the way you do this is you superimpose text over this, and you see if it fits. And so even with just a few letters, uh, you can identify it. Well, you superimpose this text over it, and you can see the top two words fit pretty well, but the rest of it doesn't work. Well, with computers, you can adjust the margins. And, of course, you don't know how wide the margins were and how uh, wide the columns were in which this was written, but when you adjust it, Bingo. It fits up and down and sideways with the word Gennesaret, that unique first, testament, uh, first century word right in the middle. This is Mark 6, 52 through 53. And as they continued to analyze it, they found several other passages from Mark and Acts and Romans and 1 Timothy and 2 Peter, which was one of the more controversial, and James verified and the real significance is this is necessarily before 68 A.D. when the Romans came in and destroyed all of this. The style of the letters indicates about 50 A.D. Now, that's probably when it was written, but it has to be before 68 A.D. Now think about that. In Mark, style of the letters indicating about 50 A.D. Now we have verified. Jesus says, you see these great buildings... Not one stone will be left upon another which will not be torn down. And what happened in 70 A.D.? The Romans marched in and the stones were thrown down and here we see a first century street that's just pummeled by the stones that were tossed down. In 70 A.D. and it was prophesied before 68 A.D. and we can prove it. You see why they don't like that. <laughs> and why they don't want to admit there's New Testament. Now, the, the same process that allowed them to identify Ezekiel and Jeremiah in the papyrus from the Greek, we use to find Mark, and uh, they accept one and not the other, because it doesn't fit their theological views. This is ongoing. 
we have, we're finding more fragments, and you don't hear a lot about this either. They're papyrus fragments. Uh, maybe New Testament, more of it will be found. Well, they are fighting that tooth and toenail. Uh, Hanan Eshel, who was a professor in one of the major universities there in Israel, in 2005 found a number of fragments from Leviticus, and uh, the Bedouins actually found it. He, in his association with them, learned that they had them. They approached him. They wanted some money. He purchased them from the Bedouins and took them immediately to the Department of Antiquities, saying, here's what we have found. Well, they didn't like what he had found, and they fired him from his university position. They imprisoned him for over a year. You're not supposed to buy this stuff from the Bedouins. Well, how did you get all of the rest of the Dead Sea Scrolls? Well, we got it from the Bedouins. <laughs> That's not supposed to be done anymore. That'll encourage looting. And, of course, we understand the problem, but they already had them. And what are you going to do? Just ignore them? Uh, he thought it made good sense to rescue them, to redeem them, as he put it, and uh, they uh, are afraid of what he's going to find. Uh, he is no longer a university professor. He's a tour guide. <laughs> However, he is working with us in our digs and in our efforts to gain permits. Uh, he has identified the cave from which these fragments came, and uh, we just finished the dig in December, uh, at the end of the calendar year. You have to publish before you can apply for a new permit. That's being published probably this month, and then we'll immediately apply for the permit to go excavate this cave where they came from. Here we see Yosef Amara, the grandson of the original finder, at the front of this collapsed cave. And one of the reasons they wanted me there was to help identify geologically the fact this was certainly a collapsed cave, and it was. And he's got in his hand a piece of the parchment. Now, this one didn't have writing on it, or at least it wasn't obvious uh, without infrared examination. But this is a collapsed cave. We want to get in there, and uh, we would love to find some more New Testament fragments. It is uh, the papyrus, the same kind that Cave 7 had. Uh, we'd appreciate your prayers there. That's, that's a very exciting prospect. Let's summarize with the significance of the Dead Sea Scrolls. First, they reveal a sect whose approach to Scripture and whose view of prophecy is exactly what you see in the early church. Not like the liberal view today, but like what we see revealed in the New Testament. As Paul said when he wrote this, uh, they received uh, it in Thessalonica as it was in truth the Word of God. As he told the people at Corinth, uh, if you're spiritual, you accept this as the commandments of the Lord. This is the way they viewed Scripture, which is unique from what's taught in the universities today. It destroys the idea that the beliefs of the New Testament were developed over hundreds of years after Christ died and after the apostles had died and this, this tradition, this myth grew. No, they, that's, that's not the case at all. Like John the Baptist, they believed they were in the desert as forerunners, and they would refer to the passages which referred to John the Baptist and apply it to themselves. But they saw that as preparation for the coming Messiah and believed it was imminent, that it was time, the time was fulfilled, as John the Baptist preached. Like Jesus and the apostles, they believed they were living in the last days of the Old Testament era and that the Scriptures very definitely promised the coming Messiah and a Messiah that was a suffering Messiah and one that would be resurrected. The apostles didn't get that during the lifetime of Christ. Finally, when the Holy Spirit came, they did, but these people understood it ahead of time. One of the lessons that we learn is the meticulous view with, by which these scriptures were copied, the accuracy of the transmission. Interestingly, Josephus, or Josephus as they call him, uh, comments on this. He says, we've been given practical proof of our reverence for our own scriptures, for uh, although such long ages have now passed, no one has ventured either to add, to remove, to alter a syllable. 
And it is an intrins- intrinsic with every Jew from the day of his birth to regard them as the decrees of God, to abide by them if need be cheerfully die for them. And that's reflected in the processes of copying that we see in the records, in the manual of discipline, and in the artifacts that have been excavated. They counted every letter after they finished copying a page. They counted sideways, and they counted upside down, and uh, across, and if the tally did not match, they threw it away and started over. So it wasn't just copying and hope they got it right. They had ways to check. And as we suggested, every book of the Old Testament is written, and we have now with this manuscripts a thousand years older than any manuscript that existed before the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls. The oldest that we had before they were discovered was the Aleppo Codex. This was the Masoretic text that dated to 900 A.D., talking about Old Testament text. That's, when the King James was translated, that's the best we could do. And up until the 40s, that's the, the best man. Well, that, this is 2,000 years after these prophets were talking. Well over 1,000 years. Uh, and all of this copying for 1,000 years has to produce some changes. It couldn't be like the original. Well, now then we have the Isaiah scroll 1,000 years earlier. And so we can check what happened over the thousand years that intervened between the oldest in 1940 and the oldest then in 1950, a thousand years earlier. Well, they compare perfectly, identical, word for word, in more than 95% of the text, and that 5% involves obvious slips of the pen and misspellings. There is no significant difference at all all, and it is one scroll from beginning to end. Well, all of these years of copying have to produce changes. Not so. When we understand the way they did it, the way they counted the letters, and then when we compare what was a thousand years earlier from the oldest, it's perfect. And that is just no longer a reasonable charge. It ain't so. When we look at the the youngest Old Testament book, scholars will differ, but conservatively, the one that was written latest is about 325 before Christ, B.C. The oldest Dead Sea Scroll was written 300 years before Christ. We've got about 25 years separating the original. Now, Wikipedia, as I suggested, said that oldest Dead Sea Scroll was 325. Well, certainly less than a generation removed from the original. We have copies today. Now, some will say, well, why don't you have the original? You can go back within 25 years. Well, we know what happened to relics like that brazen serpent that they had to destroy because the people were worshiping it. We see what our Catholic friends do today to claim relics, splinters of the cross. There's enough of them around to build this building out of. Uh, That is forestalled by, we don't have the original. But we have what goes right back to it. And if you have less than a generation removed from the original, the the generation closest to the original, and you know you don't worry... (laughs) about a thousand years, how reasonable it is to worry about the 25 years closest to the original. If you are determined to disbelieve, you have an excuse. I think God does that to those that are not honest. But to honest, reasonable people, it's not reasonable to think that this is not like the original. We can get within uh, less than a generation. And then with the New Testament, we have that which was written, we know, during the lifetime of the eyewitnesses who saw the crucifixion, who saw these events take place. It was written then, probably about 50 A.D., before prophecies 
uh, of events that occurred in 70 AD. And we can prove that. Now that's significant. Our text is dependable. Our view of prophecy is not something that's a spin hundreds of years later, but was inferred directly from the New Testament even before Christ, the Old Testament even before Christ. And the New Testament was written during the lifetime of the people who saw it. We have dependable text, and it's not reasonable to think otherwise. And therefore we conclude just exactly what Isaiah concludes as inspiration from God. The grass withers, the flower fades. Everything around us goes downhill, but there's an exception. And it has to be a supernatural exception. And it is by God's promise that the word of God stands forever. And we can defend that proposition and show that it's unreasonable to deny it.